I now look to Owen Rappaport's Standing Committee to open the case for the opposition. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. President, for this opportunity. And thank you, Chris, for delivering such a fine speech. I don't plan on switching anytime soon, but I'll let you know if I do. Now, as I hope you know, there is a very important vote coming up on November 8th, in just five days. It is a vote that is going to shape this century. It is a vote that is going to affect my country. It's a vote that's going to affect all of your countries. It is probably the most important vote so far that we have had in my lifetime. This vote, of course, is the vote between first-past-the-post voting and ranked choice voting that will happen in Maine in a ballot initiative. You might be surprised, I imagine. You were thinking I was talking about Trump versus Clinton or something like that. Yes, that is an important election, but this even more so. Chris was telling you a bit about the two-party system. I'd like to tell you a bit before I introduce the proposition about why the two-party system is what it is, how it's come to where it is today. In the United States, in every state, all 50, we have what's known as first-past-the-post voting. This is where voters can only vote for one candidate, and basically whoever gets the most votes wins. I imagine you're all familiar with it. There's another alternative, something similar to what we have here at the Union, which is known as ranked-choice voting. This is where voters can put down one, two, three, four by, say, their top four favorite candidates, and then once the lowest candidate has been eliminated, those votes are then reallocated. To quote the ballot initiative that we're going to have in Maine, do you want to allow voters to rank their choices of candidates in elections for U.S. Senate, Congress, Governor, State Senate, and State Representative, and to have ballots counted at the state level in multiple rounds in which last place candidates are eliminated until a candidate wins by majority? Now I'm going to say nothing more about the problems of ranked choice voting then that several weaker candidates can join up against one stronger candidate. And the ultimate candidate who wins can come only having had 20 or even 15% of support from the initial voters. But what I am going to say is that moving away from first-past-the-post voting, as we currently have in the United States, is a powerful indictment of the two-party system. And it is therefore wrong, because this form of voting combined with the presidential system that we have, where the legislature and the executive branches are separated, makes for a winner-take-all situation. In this situation, smaller parties are disincentivized from running their own candidates because they recognize they won't be in power. Instead, they find a larger party with whom they can relate most closely. They then go and they ally themselves in one of these maybe artificial alliances that Chris is talking about, although I do disagree, as I will tell you later on. And what ultimately ends up happening is that the number of parties is reduced and reduced until there are two dominant parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. They do this in a fashion which is very much a compromise. They bring their platform, the major party has its platform, and together they work out something which they can find in between. This isn't one large party imposing its views on another party, but what it does mean is that it leads to the system we have today in the United States. So before I lay out what I see as a broken two-party system and why the United States is by no means that, it falls upon me to introduce the speakers for the proposition. We've just heard from Chris Sibilovich, who is estimable, certainly, and is a second year reading law at Worcester College, one of the nicest colleges in Oxford from what we hear. He's also the librarian-elect of the Oxford Union. Now, Noah's term started with Brexit, it then had Frexit, followed by Dexit, and finally we had Megxit. And that's why we now have this group of people here involved in the union. And basically, we've wound up with Chris. We'll also have Senator Larry Pressler, who's a true titan of the political arena. He served two terms in the House and three terms in the Senate. During all of these, he represented the Republican Party. Senator Pressler was also a Rhodes Scholar here at Oxford, and attended Hall, and attended Teddy Hall, for which we'll forgive him. <laughs> Finally, we'll have Ray McGovern, who's a veteran CIA officer 
who chaired the national intelligence estimates in the 1980s and prepared the president's daily brief. Mr. McGovern is an outspoken commentator on intelligence-related issues in the United States. Yet what really struck me about Mr. McGovern was how familiar he looked. The beard, the comb over, the hair, the glasses. This man looks like Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> Let's just hope that Mr. McGovern is a bit more successful tonight than Mr. Corbyn would be in the same situation. <laughs> These are your speakers, Mr. President, and they are most welcome. Now, to return to what makes in the United States a unique confluence of the first past the vote, the first past the post voting system and a presidential system, and how this leads to two deeply entrenched parties, we have to ask ourselves what does it really mean for a system to be broken? In my mind, there are three central aspects of that. The first would be that politicians do not adapt to what their voters want, to their constituents. Instead, they vote entirely for themselves, they vote entirely based off of their personal preferences, and entirely based off of their convictions. In fact, they would even go so far as to ignore their constituents, no matter whether or not they can be reelected. The second aspect of a broken two-party system, in my mind, is that gridlock is so extensive that legislation cannot be passed. This means that literally nothing can be done. The third is a significant polarization, both among members of Congress, the president, members of the ruling elite, if we'll call them that, as well as among common voters. This polarization can range from immigration to range in its causes from immigration to globalization to simple social and racial tension. So let's ask, is this two-party system broken? After my introduction from Chris, you can probably guess that my answer to that question is a firm no. The system, first and foremost, is readily able to adapt to what voters want, and it does this in two distinct fashions. The first is through a co-option or adaptation of third-party ideals, so that it does not shut out those alternative viewpoints. We can see this because one policy parties rise up very frequently in the United States and are readily integrated into the two-party system. Let's also make clear, however, that these one-issue parties are not truly viable parties. This is by no means a three-party or four-party system. Instead, they are coming in on a single issue, they are pushing the, converse, the national conversation on that topic, and then are normally being swept up. No, thank you, Brian. So let's look to 1992, if I may. It was George Bush Sr. versus Bill Clinton in a, he, in a hotly contested election. What happened was that there was a third party candidate, if we'll call him that, or an independent, a guy by the name of Ross Perot. Ross Perot ran on one central issue, and that was the national deficit. In his mind, this was something that had to be solved, and it had to be solved right away. He got something like 15% of the vote in the final election, but of course he wasn't elected. Crucially, however, you can look at Bill Clinton's first term in the presidency, and you can see just how much he did that had to do with the national deficit. You can then ask, was this Bill Clinton's plan all along? Absolutely not. Instead, Bill Clinton had adapted a third party candidate's views and brought those into his own policy and brought those into how he governed. A very similar thing happens in 2000 if we look back. We have Al Gore versus George W. Bush. Then there's a third party candidate, Ralph Nader, who I imagine was an inconvenient truth for Al Gore. However, what happened was that Ralph Nader brought in the environment issue to the fore. He pushed it hard into the national agenda. And we then see George W. Bush engaging with it. Admittedly, he was a Republican, so he didn't do too much on it. But what did happen was that Barack Obama worked hard at it. And this was all because of Ralph Nader. Here is a standard of the two-party system. No, thank you. What happens is that these two parties see that there is a real niche for certain politicians to rise up, and they then go and they then co-opt in those ideas, and they take them on. That is why the two-party system doesn't shut out voices. In fact, 
it readily and happily and consistently takes them on. The other option in the two-party system where we can see a new introduction of ideas is through kind of an internal reconciliation within a party. A classic example of this we've had this very year in the, prime, in the Democratic primary between Hillary Clinton and Senator Bernie Sanders. What happened was that Senator Sanders ran on a very firm anti-globalization platform trying to energize uh, the common voter and to really restore populism. What, one, of, one of his major issues was free trade around the world. Hillary Clinton, of course, had been a vocal proponent of free trade during her time as Secretary of State. She had famously supported the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yet if you ask Secretary Clinton today, do you support the Trans-Pacific Partnership? She says, absolutely not. For me, ladies and gentlemen, that's not flip-flopping. Instead, that is co-opting the ideas of a different, of, of within your party, of a different wing of your party. No, thank you. They seem to all be coming from over here. <laughs> That's instead co-opting in the ideas of a different segment of your party to make a stronger, unified whole. This is how the two-party system governs. It develops, it is dynamic, and it changes and it adapts. Let's move on to the second reason why a two-party system could be broken. This is the idea that legislation cannot be carried through Congress. I firmly disagree. First and foremost, we have the Affordable Care Act of 2010. That passed. That has given health care to millions of Americans who wouldn't have had it otherwise. We also have the Stimulus Act in 2009. Once more, this was by no means originally a bipartisan effort. But what happened was that the two parties came together and worked together because they recognized this was the best thing for the country. We then finally have the, the No Child Left Behind Act and a significant restructuring of it in which I imagine Congressman McDermott was involved, which passed just at the very end of 2015, about 10 months ago. This once more was bipartisan. No Child Left Behind was the kind of signature legislation from George W. Bush's administration on education. And this was a total and complete overhaul. To say that Washington is polarized at the moment is to ignore the facts on the ground. It is to look at sensationalism in the press about things like Merrick Garland and to very selectively choose your facts. It is simply not true. I would also adduce the fact that polarization in Washington can not only be blamed on the two-party system, or that gridlock in Washington can not only be blamed on the two-party system. We have to recognize that the United States is unique in terms of its elections. Every four years, we have a presidential election. But every two years, we have an election for the Congress. And this means that there are elections where the presidential party isn't really as involved as it is in a presidential year. It means that the coattails of the president can extend all the way. And it consistently means that there is a reaction back towards the party which is not the president's party. So to say that that's a, a facet of the two-party system, that there is some sort of gridlock in Washington, is ignoring this unique structure of voting that we have in the United States. I finally want to discuss the significant polarization and the idea that that reflects a two-party system. For me, how can such significant polarization be caused by the two-party system when it is truly a worldwide phenomenon? Yes, there are social and political tensions throughout the United States. However, I think that saying just that is ignoring them throughout Europe. We can very obviously look at Brexit. We can also look, no thank you. <laughs> we can also look at Germany and we can see that in Germany there is a rising nationalist party, the alternative for Germany, which is very much coming up in an anti-immigrant sense, almost in a fascist sense. We can also look to Denmark, where in one of these hollowed Scandinavian social democracies, there is a rising anti-immigrant party known as the Danish People's Party. Sure, please. I, I take the honorable member's point. I would argue that these ideas are just as much reflected in Denmark and in the Scandinavian countries, and in fact, throughout Europe and throughout the Western world, as they are by Donald Trump. Although what I do think, and this is to return to, to my central point, there is a unique political alignment in the United States, which is given birth to by a set of Protestant ethics, by a long history of slavery, and basically by the history of our country and how it has been shaped. It's an immigrant, it's an immigrant country. And so we are, maybe unfortunately, maybe not unfortunately, depending on your viewpoint, 
aligned to the right of every Western democracy. So, for instance, I here am a conservative, whereas in the United States, I am a Democrat. And so I think that having very loudly pro-trade and pro-globalization parties in the United States leads to more significant feelings of disenfranchisement, more significant feelings of being left behind. But I do not think that that is caused by the two-party system. I do not think you can blame that on the two-party system. I think you can blame it on American history, but that's not what we're debating tonight. So to return to the 2016 election, I've hopefully made clear why the two-party system is not broken. But there's a final example that I hope will sway any undecided voters. And let me say that if you're undecided at this late in the campaign, it says more about you than it does about me. However, the recent Republican primary contest resembled very much a multi-party contest. There were four ideological groups, or parties if you want to call them that. There was the center-right movement of, of John Kasich and of Jeb Bush. There was the movement of Marco Rubio. There was Ted Cruz and the Evangelical Christian Conservative Movement. And there was Donald Trump's insanity. <laughs> to say that this was a multi-party contest, in my mind, is pretty accurate because the three parties which were not Donald Trump did not unite to deny him the nomination. However, what emerged from this multi-party contest, of course, Donald Trump. Yet what emerged from a two-party contest in the Democratic primary was Hillary Clinton. What will hopefully emerge next Tuesday from a two-party contest will be Hillary Clinton. So if you look at Hillary Clinton, the output of a two-party system, if you look at Donald Trump, the output of a multi-party system, which way and which one do you really think is broken? I urge you to vote for the opposition. Thank you.